The world is sinking, but Africa is rising. It's time for Africa to turn the tide of political conflict, economic uncertainty, and moral decadence. The time is now for Africa to arise and rebuild. Inspire E-Conference 2023 will give you the tools and strategies to be part of Africa's rebuild. Join us online this August from Monday the 7th to Saturday the 12th from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. East African time as we gather the brightest minds across the continent to discuss the rebuilding of Africa. Book your slot today and be part of the movement that will change Africa forever. Africa, arise and build. I'm having the privilege to introduce our first panelist, who is all the way from South Africa. So our first panelist is Kakratif. Kakratif is a highly accomplished figure in the corporate banking sector. I think these are the people who said speak a lot of English. Kaki will, <laughs> you will <laughs> correct us. <laughs> uh, boasting a remarkable 22-year career with prominent institutions such as Ned Bank, Absa Capital, and Rand Merchant Bank. His experience covers a diverse range of areas, including trade, FX risk management, working capital, and transactional banking. Throughout his career, Kirk has successfully negotiated significant deals with multi multinational corporations, both in South Africa and across the African continent, earning him a prestigious award such as the Landmark Deal of the Year 2023, and another one, the esteemed RMB Founders Award of 2023. Wow, congratulations, Kirk. And parallel to his flourishing professional path, Kirk's spiritual journey began at a young age, having grown up in the Baptist church and becoming born again at a tender age of 16, he co uh, planted a church in Johannesburg at the age of 19. Presently, Kirk actively serves as an, as an elder in a strong apostolic calling in the frontline church, where he also serves as the director of frontline Christian school. He is also um, had a profound blend of award-winning corporate experience and deep-rooted spiritual leadership. All this makes him an amazing and invaluable person for this panel today. So we are happy to have you. You are embodying a unique fusion of professional acumen and faith-driven dedication. Kak is happily married to his beloved wife, Renette, for 19 years, and they are blessed with two lovely daughters, Jasmine and Kali. Kak, we are privileged to have you this um, same evening from the Pearl of Africa. Um, um, thank you for joining us, and we are happy to listen to your submission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian, and thank you to everybody um, who's listening in tonight. I also just want to um, just to thank Joel for that truly inspiring um, you know, view of the, the, the stone soup, which is uh, at its very core about community. And, and so thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Joel, I, I, am, I, I have been working for bank and for banks for the last 22 years. Um, um, and yes, I, I think uh, at the very core, it's about how do we access capital, um, and, and you've, you've raised a, a way of doing it, but perhaps there's different options to consider, not just in South Africa, but across the continent. And, and over the last um, 20 years, uh, it's been my privilege to be able to be part of, um, you know, making those deals. And I think one of the questions that was raised um, in the Q&A around risk management is, is, is a great segue of how do we enable these deals? And, and as you know, banks are, uh, by its very nature, they are sophisticated risk managers. You know, so you know, to, to prove the point, I, I work for an organization that um, is three and a half thousand people strong uh, and has been uh, in 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 banking or in this sector, a merchant bank for the last 20, 20 years. This bank belongs to another bank called the First Rand Group. And that bank employs over 50,000 people. 
So I, I think there's there's a merit to say that you know there's a a a group of people coming together to manage risk, deploy capital, um, you know, between buyer and seller, investor and investee, um, you know, to ensure that business happens and that there's um call it a flourishing economy, a flourishing um community um you know uh, uh, not just in locally but but uh, across the continent so I, th I think it was insightful to to hear the social compact and and how to to bring that together but i think i'm going to focus just in the short time that i have around how do we how do we enable the flow of business um by managing risk effectively uh, and there's there's two particular ways that I, I would love to highlight. Um, that has been um, probably one of the, uh, or two of the ways that we've been able to successfully manage risk on the continent, um, where buyer and seller are entering into a new relationship, where perhaps, um, you know, there, there isn't an element of trust that's established yet. Um, I mean, the the first prize is always for that relationship to to be in place, and for no, you know, for no middlemen like banks to be involved, um, because it it adds uh, it adds complexity. It potentially adds, uh, you know, the the idea of margin erosion to the entire uh, transaction. So. But there is a place for banks, and and it's usually uh, when buy and seller, uh, especially when it comes to trade, um, are on the two opposite sides of risk, uh, right? So if I take if I take the investor as an example, um, the investor is concerned about, and Joel, you 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 correctly pointed out, the investor is concerned about if I invest my money. Will I get the return, or will there be performance that takes place on the back of my investment? So, the the consideration there is performance risk. So, if I deploy my capital, um, will and and to the to the party that I'm investing into, or a project that I'm investing into, will there be performance? Meaning, will the project uh, take off? Will there be, as Joel uh, quite quite rightly points out, uh, will there be something that is seen uh, delivered on the back of the of the deployment of capital? So I think that's on the one side. the The party receiving the cash or 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 the investment capital, their consideration is, if I deploy my resources on the back of a commitment that is made and perhaps it happens you know through a phased approach and um, there's phase one and there's there's a tranche of capital that's deployed the risk that the the party takes is that capital will stop possibly uh, uh, you know after the first tranche tranche or midway through the project and then there's costs that they incur to actually, uh, you know, to to fulfill on the project. So, where banks are are typically um, very well astute to to be almost the middleman is in two scenarios. And and maybe if you're taking notes there today, um, one of the ways is the issuance of letters of credit. Now, what letters of credit are is an undertaking by a bank in favor of a beneficiary. And in, in this case, right, so it, the beneficiary would be the party um, contracted to perform on, on the back of um, an agreement, right? And it, it promises payment to this party, provided that 
they fulfill their obligations as set out in the letter of credit. And how they do that is they have to produce documentation that proves to the bank that they fulfill the obligations under the contract. So, and, and we, we've structured deals like this on the, con on the continent, and it's not new to, to traders, it's not new to infrastructure developers, um, but perhaps it, it, it is something that is underestimated, undervalued, because you no longer have an undertaking from an investor, you have an undertaking from a bank to make, make good on a payment provided that certain obligations are, are um, adhered to or fulfilled. What does that mean for, for the party receiving a letter of credit? It tells you a few things. It tells you that the investor was able to, to have their bank or a bank establish a letter of credit in your favor. That means that their credit worthiness is not in question. Right? So I think that's, that's the first point. The second point is that a bank's risk is typically um, much lower than any, even a, a corporate investor. Uh, and that has to do with the unique position that a bank holds. It's, it's the financier. It also has, it's, it's often government bank backed. Um, so it's, it's risk rating is much lower than, than that of uh, a, a potential investor uh, or a group of people coming together to invest in, in a particular project. What that gives the beneficiary of a letter of credit the, the ability to do is actually to extract value from a letter of credit before certain obligations are fulfilled. So if you are a if you are a uh, the beneficiary you in, rec in in receipt of a letter of credit you can take that letter of credit to a bank of your choice or a bank that you are familiar with that's familiar with you and you can say let's make make an arg uh, for argument's sake say Rand Merchant Bank has issued this letter of credit in favor of yourself you can take that letter of credit to your bank and say, um, dear my bank, please take risk on Rand Merchant Bank, but pay me a portion of this letter of credit so that I can start my project. But your risk is Rand Merchant Bank. And, and because there's a difference in risk rating, the, the potential for receiving upfront cash and at a much lower rate is possible, but you're utilizing the banks to unlock capital that you would normally not have had access to. So, so again, maybe that's, that's one way. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy. Um, I'm, I'm just mindful of the time. I'm more than comfortable if anybody on this, on this uh, seminar tonight or, you know, on, on the, on the zoom, uh, would like to find out more about how to structure letters of credit, what they look like, um, the construct, uh, how would you negotiate the terms under a letter of credit, uh, what would a buyer and a seller be comfortable with where risk is concerned, but essentially you have two parties and a bank in the middle that undertakes to pay provided that certain obligations are fulfilled. So that's option number one. Um, option number two, if we can move on and happy to take uh, questions after this, but option number two revolves around um, escrow solutions. So very similar in concept, an idea, but it, there's an escrow agreement in place between buyer and sell, seller. The escrow uh, holder or manager would typically be the bank. And 
again, you have certain obligations that are fulfilled by the seller or the or the 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 person who is exchanging uh, work for cash or for investment. Um, and on the how the escrow is structured is very similar to that of a letter of credit. And the bank acts as the agent. Once there's proof that certain obligations or i.e. I think Joel mentioned certain milestones earlier. So if there are certain milestones that are achieved and there's very specific documentation that uh, is agreed upon upfront between buyer and seller, that if you present these different documentation representing the, the fulfillment of certain milestones, that cash would be released or capital will be released for the next phase of, um, of the project. And you would ask yourself, how would you structure that? It would be on the merits of the deal. So it would be buy and sell approaching a bank that says, look, look at what, what we uh, are willing to do um, you know, between buy and seller. This is the project. This is the merits of the projects. This is the compliance around the project. Um, and as you know, um, I think banks are one of the most regulated um, entities in the world is to is to give the bank comfort that there's a legitimate project. It's backed by investors. And if essentially the bank acts as an agent to manage the risk associated with the transaction between buyer and seller. Um, so those are the, the two options um, that I thought I would share with the audience here today. Uh, we've done um, a, a myriad of these in various different ways, various forms, different structures involving um, actual commodities, uh, infrastructure pro projects. Um, it could also be financial transactions in in um, the exchange of shares and the like on the continent. And it's it happens most likely, I, I was, I'm just thinking today, there's probably a lot more uh, transactions like this that is being managed by the bank. The flow of, of the cash out um, and the, the acceptance of, of cash in, depending on which side of the transaction um, our, our clients find themselves. So uh, Lillian, I, I don't know if, if that gives the audience a, a bit of a sense of what some other options are. Uh, we've had the stone soup option, which I think is from a social <laughs> compact perspective is yeah. absolutely first prize, right? I mean, you wouldn't want to, to load a transaction with more fees. And as you know, banks uh, love for, in exchange for the sophisticated system and risk management behind it. It would do, wouldn't do this for free. There would be a, a, a risk, a premium, uh, an operational premium attached to it. Um, but in the absence of trust between buyer and seller, he has a viable, he has two viable options to consider. And to raise this, raise the, uh, or have a bank issue letters of credit, just from, um, you know, uh, you know, if you think about collateral, putting up collateral, the, the requirement is much less than what it would be for an overdraft or a, a financial product like that. This, this is what is termed indirect credit facilities meaning that the bank takes very little risk, actually, because as long as the buyer, um, you know, is happy that, that there's a fulfillment of obligations and the, the seller fulfills the obligations, um, that all, all the bank really is doing is managing the risks that are inherent in the transaction. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gives, gives a bit of clarity in as to what uh, what those two options entail. 
Yes, yes, they do. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, Kak, very, very great insights indeed, as Florence, uh, Florence Annette is saying. And if you have any questions, please put in on the Q&A section and uh, Kak is going to respond to them. Uh, Kak, when you're still online, I think uh, from what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, so, so the soup model, so to speak, is more like a crowdfunding, which looks like it will work well within um, a local setting. You are not, like within a, uh, people who know each other, there's a community around it. And then when you talk about the letters of credit and the escrow, it's more, I think it's more viable, feasible when you're involved with international transactions. Yeah. yeah? So, cause I've, I've seen, um, so one of the places that I worked before, so we had to buy like big machinery. And so you don't want to release the money before you receive the machinery, cause you don't know yeah. if they're going to, send the real thing you've ordered for but also the supplier is i don't want to send my machinery across the seas and and then you don't you, you know you default so i think yeah. the letters of credit uh, at that time we used it too so all of us were happy that none so so as we didn't have the money it's with the bank and the supplier is sure that when the product reaches in good condition it's going to be released to them so i think for international transaction it really really works works well so um if we have questions let's let's have keep them coming uh and we are going to have it answered uh, i think i'm seeing here anonymous attendee is asking thank you for your presentation do bank compound interest <laughs> if so why is huh? i don't know if why is it legal or is it illegal i don't know if you've understood the question Doug. yeah i, I think it, there's obviously uh, different jurisdictions um and mm -hmm. then there might be different rules for for different countries as well or central banks um so i i, I think it would be important to understand the context um which country are we referring to um in particular um and yeah just just from from a south african perspective um mm -hmm. you know there are certain rules concerning interest for banks uh compound interest um really is for uh, capital that's being invested and not necessarily for for capital that are, is being deployed um against the credit line um, so, so that's just um, to to bear in mind, and there's certain rules and, and frameworks that exist around that as to why why that's permissible for investments versus uh, uh, the extension of credit. The world is sinking, but Africa is rising. It's time for Africa to turn the tide of political conflict, economic uncertainty, and moral decadence. The time is now for Africa to arise and reveal. Inspire E-Conference 2023 will give you the tools and strategies to be part of Africa's reveal. Join us online this August from Monday the 7th to Saturday the 12th from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. East African time as we gather the brightest minds across the continent to discuss the rebuilding of Africa. Book your slot today and be part of the movement that will change Africa forever. Africa, arise and build.